Hi everybody, this is Amitai from Dizra here. I wanted to tell you a bit about Elm, which is basically a new approach to building web application. I'd like to start with the principle of Elm, and I call it Elm, but honestly it's a mix of different things, like uh, Flux that you might have uh, heard about from Facebook, or Redux, but I'm just gonna call it Elm just for the sake of simplicity. So, the first principle is the single source of truth. So, if you're coming like us, uh, like Gizra, that we've been developing Angular for so long, that then you know that there isn't really a single source of truth, in the sense that, well, we've been kind of probably abusing the, the router in order to know about the state of our application, but that's not enough, right? You don't know if the user is logged in from the URL or are you fetching some data from the server. So basically you start calling different services and different controllers that are scattered, scattered around your application. And up until reading this principle, I kind of thought I was doing it the right way in the sense that, you know, everything was loosely coupled. However, it just doesn't work properly. It's definitely too much scattered around and there isn't that single source of truth knowing what's the state of my application. So, it might be a little counterintuitive, but basically the first principle is saying the entire state of your application is in one single object, one record tree that holds everything. So you could even potentially mock that, that object and reach exactly a certain state of your application. Continuing from that principle, there's the second principle, which is the state is read-only, meaning that object is completely immutable. You cannot touch it. The only way of changing that immutable, even it's not changing, it's creating a new object, is by emitting an action. So when I read, read that principle, it made, made me realize that the same thing that made me fall in love with Angular like two or three years ago, it's probably the same thing that now causes me to hate it, which is the two-way binding. So the problem with two-way binding, well, when I saw it a few years ago, I told myself, oh my God, this is you know saving me so much lines of Java, jQuery code or JavaScript, whatever. But in fact, what happened is my view is able to directly interact with my model, change it and, you know, cause cascading uh, effects which are changing other models, other services and so on. So the idea is over here is if you have a button on your screen, for example, and you click on it, you know what happens in Elm? absolutely nothing and that's beautiful that's great what really happened is it's just sending an action saying a button was clicked now it's up to us to wire it together and make sure that the clicked button is doing only what it could be do should be doing so when we're talking about uh, you know this immutable state oftentimes i'm seeing uh, people talking about time travel debugger so over here you can see uh, a very small Elm program that basically creates a small game of Mario jumping around. And what you can see is every pixel that Mario is moving is being traced. We basically, when, only when we're in debugging mode, we remember past states. It doesn't happen on, you know, non-debug uh, mode. So we remember the past states. These are different objects. So you, we could, you know, stop Mario in a certain point and start moving you know, time traveling and seeing the different states and even hit the play button again and make Mario jump from that point onwards. But honestly, this doesn't make me excited. What makes me excited is this screen. <laughs> the example one of the counter. So, you know, you can probably imagine what happens when you click the different buttons, when you click on the, on the plus sign, the number increments, when you click on the minus, it decrements. Let's jump into the code. It's really not important to understand every single line of code just to understand the, the different, in general, the different principles, how they're implemented over here. So we have a counter.elm file and we have a model called counter and we have this model called, uh, which is basically an integer, right? That's our number. That's the zero, the one, the minus one, and so on. And then a pretty magical thing happened for me, even more magical than this, than this time travel debugger is I have this type action equals increment and decrement. This is completely arbitrary. We are basically telling the system which actions can be done on the model. I'm able to increment it, I'm able to decrement it. And the reason I think it's so magical is well, if you look at any Angular application and you'll ask even a senior developer, what are the actions you are able to do on your web application? They probably will have no clue or they will need to go over the code and start reading it in different places, in the controller, in the view, whatnot. 
over here this is so declarative it's so concise even if you're a, a junior developer jumping into an, a, an old existing project you know exactly what are the type of actions you are able to do so over here we have the update action which basically we type in and say you will have to pass me a certain action that increment or decrement your existing model and in return you will get a new model. So when it's increment, I'm incrementing. When it's decrement, I'm decrementing. The view itself, it might look a bit, you know, the HTML looks a bit weird, but again, it's just syntax, so deal with it. So over here, you have a button with the text, which is a minus, and when you on click, when you click on it, basically, we're just emitting that action, the decrement, which uh, later on in the update function, we decide what to do with it. Over here, you can see that we have uh, some CSS. So obviously, we could use, you know, for static CSS, bootstrap, whatever we want. For the more dynamic CSS, we're able to inline our CSS over here. So what happen happens when we have, you know, a second example, a pair of counter, basically something on the top, something on the bottom, and a recent button. So basically, the counter dot elm, that's elm counter model model, sorry, will remain exactly the same. Let's have a quick look at counterpair.elm. Again, not important to understand every single line. So over here we define our model and we import the previous counter that we've just created. Now the same pattern of this model updated view returns over here as well. So we have the model which is just, you know, we just say we have a top counter and it is a counter.model. So even though it's not object oriented, we can still see encapsulation over here we're saying the top counter has some model which belongs to counter. We don't know what it is. Right now it's a simple integer. Integer. It could have been even more complex stuff. Later on we can see again this magical thing called the action which we basically define. Here we have a reset and here on the top this is the name of my action and it will get a certain argument. What is this argument? It is an action that belongs to counter, the same encapsulation in our example, it will be increment or decrement. The update function following the same pattern, when it's recent, I'm just resetting the both counters. When it's a top, it's getting the, uh, the argument of the actual action, and we pipe it down into the counter update, which we do almost the same talking about the view, meaning I don't need to know about the internals of how counter itself renders its own view. I can simply call that counter view. So, what's fun about Elm, it's a compiled language, meaning it's being com compiled into HTML and JavaScript and CSS. So, if I would say that my model is a string instead of an integer, then Elm would be kind enough to complain about it, show me exactly where the problem is, and even tell me, listen, you told me the model is a string, but I kind of thought it's going to be a number, an integer, or a float. And what's fun about Elm, and I actually, I'm happy to say that I felt it myself, is there is a saying that if you are able to satisfy the compiler, there is a really good chance that your application or your feature will be simply working. And, you know, unless you're writing crazy logic, usually it happens. It's, an, it's, a, it's a great, it's a great feel, feeling. So coming from, you know, this headless Drupal, meaning Drupal in the backend and some frontend library, in this case Elm, uh, in the front, what we started doing is uh, porting our Headley example, the one that basically we have a Yeoman generator called Headley. So when you write Yo Headley, it's scaffold a fully working example with a Drupal backend, you know, with a, a RESTful uh, Drupal backend and an Angular application on the front. Basically, we're taking that Angular application and we convert it into Elm. And maybe it doesn't look super exciting what you're seeing over here. We definitely uh, plan to make it uh, more exciting and add all the features but basically you can see that what's already working is you're able to log in into your Drupal backend be authenticated get all the events uh, uh, through RESTful API of course all the events that that user can see and filter those events following uh, our nature of uh, contributing as soon as, as we can. We've already created this Yeoman generator for Elm, so basically you can write your Elm lang and it will scaffold all the files you need to start working on your next web app application. Basically it has Gulp, which is um, 
integrate it with part of those things or whenever you do any change in your SAS files or Elm file, Elm file, it will automatically reload and it will automatically compile Elm, automatically comp compile your SAS and obviously you can even uh, bundle and deploy to GitHub pages. So, I hope I got you excited about Elm and I'm looking forward uh, to see you in the Elm Lang issue queues and working groups and I hope uh, you can make Elm Lang's community even awesomer than it is right now. Bye!